so that we don't have to do this in the classroom. Especially careful attention, although it's 
you know, since we've got a long enough piece here, it's not likely that it would get cockeyed, but uh, still out of uh, sheer discipline, you want to maintain control of the piece that is in between the, the blade and the fence. So with that, if uh, I'm, I'm Rob will turn the machine on here.
accomplish the same thing by taking a, a piece of wood, cut it to um, one inch thickness. You don't need to need to go out and invest in a one, two, three block unless you need it for something else. So with that, I think we're gonna move on to the next phase. Okay, here we're about to cut out a pattern for the handle for the sleds. So I got a piece of uh, thin uh, hardwood here and I'm gonna begin by cutting cutting this out with a nice radius here to grab a hold of and come up this way. That way we can use this as a pattern to replicate on the four other handles. edit the dogs out, I might as well give them attribution. We'll, uh, next thing you know, they'll be getting an agent. Bob, well, what is that thing you had that you uh, saw with the hanging on the chest? I don't see That's that. the remote control pendant for the dust collector. Okay. Well, uh, it's, a, it's an option that Oneida provides that um, just gives you a real convenient place regardless of what machine you're in front of. You don't have to go walking back all the way back to the machine to push the button. Sure. In rock shop, you could uh, you could spend a half a day walking from <laughs> one end of the shop to the other if you did that for each. Well, each all side the gates open at the same time. No, no, we uh, we open an individual gate. You just open the individual gate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got cheap about that. I wasn't gonna get those mechanisms where you turn on the equipment and it turns on those things. Yeah, that those uh, remote control gates do get kind of pricey in a hurry. I think uh, every price of those things when you. When you turn on a machine and the gate opens, I think those things run about 
150 apiece. No. <laughs> you put that money into a Christmas tree. Yeah, you won't. Uh, you won't buy me a forklift either. So I, I can't imagine one. <laughs> okay, uh, what you just saw on the video there was how we made uh, these two pieces here. Uh, these two pieces that are going to turn out to be uh, cutoff sleds and the the tilt of the 45 or what I call it, the flat 45, and also these. Uh, this is the pattern that you saw me cut out on the bandsaw. Use that as a pattern to then trace over these uh, big poplar pieces. I had this thing, I had this thing hanging around for several years. I don't know why I got it to begin with, but I figured, well, this looks like a good candidate for some handles for these sleds. What a handle like this permits you to do: not only does it true up the base of the sled. Uh, but it also gives you, a, gives you a good pushing surface to push the thing and keep your hands clear of the blade. By the way, Bob, I have a comment. My workshop table's uh, MDF three quarter inch. Yes. I did that by myself. It's nice to have two or three people to handle this. Yeah. 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 yeah, I got kind of got the idea for the uh, for the video when, when we started thinking about how in the world are we going to get a full sheet of MDF in here in a classroom full of people. And the, uh, I don't know how many of you have, have cut MDF, but it uh, it just really gives me some serious respiratory problems. Well, we have a former member who's got pneumonia from breathing MDF dust. Really? Mm -hmm. It weighs 400 pounds. Yeah, it, it, it's... I had to get somebody to help me put it in the back of the truck for that day. It's some, uh, it's some pretty awful stuff weight-wise. Um, any other questions at this point? Okay. All right, what you're going to see us do here is um, each of these flat pieces, we're going to wind up attaching uh, guide bars to the bottom of them. For the guide bars, what I prefer to use is a guide bar that is produced by Craig. This, this thing normally comes in a you know, pretty sizable length. Uh, what I do is I, I take them as I get them, uh, cut them into parts, and machine off the, the end to receive this step washer. Uh, since I no longer have access to uh, any kind of machine tools, I had to they borrow and steal. I got uh, Jim Kunzweiler to machine some of these things for me, and then I went over to Jack's and used his equipment. What the whole purpose of that machining operation is, is to put that step washer on the end that permits this bar to go in here. And as is often the case when you slide a, a sled off the end of the table, without that washer on there, going to wind up happening. You're going to slide that thing off there and the sled is going to bounce up, hit your feet, cause you to start swearing and, and probably you know, break or bend the sled. <laughs> so what this washer does is it permits you to slide this thing just way off the table there and it's not going anywhere. So stay put. So that's kind of the reason for that uh, step washer. Can you pass one of those around, Bob? Sure. Bob? Um. Why didn't you use, I forget what it's called, they sell it here, the thin plastic that you can that you could use for runners? You can use thin plastic, you could use wood, uh, any number of things like that. Okay. But uh, any, any of those things would work. The main reason that I like these things is the fact that these have cross-drilled holes through them that are threaded. Okay. Uh, there's When you order one of these things as a kit, those plastic inserts come with it. You run those in the end, and that then provides you with an adjustment so that when these things start to get a little bigger as the um, UHMW material 
or a piece of wood does, it'll get a little sloppy. There's various ways people have come up with to correct that. You know, I've seen a lot of people take a little piece of hard maple or something like that, use that for a runner, and they'll do a little, little split of some kind down the center of it and run a screw in there to cause the, the hard maple to spread out to compensate for that. Since I had uh, a lot of uh, metalworking experience in my background, I saw these things and I thought, gee, these, these people have already solved it for me, so I'll use it. Okay. Just yes, sir. That's what I'm saying. So, you said you ordered those, you can't buy them like here? Uh, no, they're a special order item from Craig. You can go to the Craig website and get them. Some of the tool stores used to carry them, but uh, People would look at them and scratch their head and go, what do I do with this? <laughs> so uh, not too many of the stores carry them. It was rumored when I went to get some of these that Craig quit making them, but Craig assured me when I ordered them that that's not the case. Those bars do come in twice that length. You know, he had to machine it down to put the washer and stuff on, but they are longer, so if you want to start out for a bigger one, you can order them like that. Is the washer part of the kit, or is that something else? Uh, the washer is extra. It, it's another another item. Is that aluminum? Huh? Yes. Yeah, it's aluminum. Don't cut it with a chop. Yeah, you don't want to cut that with a with a saw stop. Saw stop. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Yeah. yeah. hundred some dollars later. Yeah, it, it, it'll it'll cost you about one hundred and forty dollars, and all it does is make a little mark on the on the piece of aluminum. <laughs> so, where would you get it machined if you can't use your saw stop and you have no knowledge on metal work? Uh, Jack Morse has a has an end mill. Um, so does Jim Cunsweiler. Matter of fact, uh, I took a look you, you at could attempt it yourself on a router table. <laughs> well, yeah, you could you could attempt to do it on the router table, which is what I did here until I decided to take too aggressive of a cut. I took a took a really nice uh, solid carbide spiral bit, and uh, the thing kind of got away from me a little bit. I heard this big angry noise, grinding noise, and then the next thing you knew, there was a router bit bouncing off the ceiling, hit the floor, and I thought, I'm glad I wasn't in the way of it. <laughs> I turned around and said, man, that cut sounds aggressive. He said, yeah, the router bit's over there. <laughs> Okay, now that what this piece is going to wind up being is a, a vertical 45. Uh, we're going to cut out the blank here. <coughs> this is going to be a, a second piece that's going to be attached to it in this fashion. What this would typically be used for is to make a really nice 45 degree miter that you could use for a picture frame or any kind of a thing that you want to, that you want to frame up. Then we're going to attach a handle on the top to allow you to push the thing through. And it's going to be up to you to remember with this particular unit when to stop the blade. And if you want to, you can just keep running your sled all the way through there and you're going to wind up with a sled in two halves. You know, it'll be you know, no longer useful for, for a 45 degree miter sled. <coughs> We're, we're assuming that you know, by the time I get done, I'll probably draw a line here and say stop here, <laughs> just as a reminder. <laughs> Sometimes people put cleats on the bottom of the sled that hit the, the table. Oh, yeah. So yeah. You can't go any further. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. I've done that on, the, on my uh, bandsaw sleds before. Yeah. Sometimes you have to, like on a circle cutting jig. You got to put a stop on that. I also have something similar to this for my regular arm thumb, so I don't have to move the arm. Okay. Just leave it at 90 degrees, and you've mm -hmm. got 45s all day. Right? Okay. Sled. I've never never owned a rated arm saw, so. Do you need one? I got one of your other ones. Too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next uh, step of the process is you need to mark where the uh, guide bars are going to go on the bottom of the sled. What I'll do is slide this thing across. I'm 
only using the washer on one of these because it's you know redundant to have two of them unless you fear them uh, coming detached for some reason. I thought I had made a center mark on there, but I guess it went away. Okay, the, the sled itself is exactly 30 inches across. I'll make a center mark at, at 15 so that I know the path that the, the blade is going to go through. <coughs> Then use the fence to help me slide, guide the thing, line it up. So I set the fence at 15 inches. And slide the slide over to it. And now I know uh, it would be too much, too much trouble to get Buzz to get around to this side, but he'll be able to see the other side when I get to it. What I do is I, I can push the cars far enough through there that I can see the end zone and I mark where the swing of the camera around. It's already, that one's focused on David. Yeah. What I do is I mark where the, where the guide bars penetrate through. So I describe the ends here as to where they're gonna where they're gonna stick through the back side. Then what I do is slide it slide it back until I see the bars again. Go over here on this side, mark here, you know, like I did on this other side, as to where the guide bars are gonna stick through. Slide over, take a straight edge, and then scribe. Basically, connect the dots <laughs> as to where the guide bars are going to go. Yep, gotta be uh, gotta be pretty accurate. Did you know how to cut any data that way? No. Yep. Oh, that way, also, you've got some room for adjustment if you need it. your bars on there and get it lined up exactly even between the lines. And I'll go let uh, Rob drill some holes in there and put some screws in. Eventually. I can't believe I was pushing it and just not going anywhere. You know, I think it's smart to work here. We'll send you send you re to retraining the screws. Are you going to glue it? No. No, I don't like using glue.
Okay, what this uh, what this sandpaper does it permits you to put a surface on there so that when you're ready to cut a piece of wood, that it won't move. It's going to stay on top of the sled. It's going to follow exactly where the sled goes, which is the whole reason why you're building a table saw sled to begin with. Some of this stuff may, may try to come loose on you. If it does, just lift it up with some spray adhesive underneath. Yes, sir. Can you put this <coughs> along the side of the top piece sandpaper is out down flat? Yeah, oh, put some here, you mean? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was just going to talk about that part and not do it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Jerry does have a good good point there. On uh, on the sleds that I got at home, I put uh, put sandpaper here as well, so that as you're if you're holding back against this piece, it you know if you get, grab a hold of the end of the thing, it's not going to want to slide. Unlike when you're trying to use one of the supplied uh, miter gauges, these things are pretty hard to control when you're when you're trying to get a really precise cut. I think that piece that you're talking about do more good than the one that's already on there. As long as you remember which side of the cut. As long as you get the right corners. Standing 45, because the material is going to be resting at a 
45 degree angle. Okay, we'll repeat the process again where we stick through. Anyway, I've already, I've already pre marked <coughs> where the, uh, the guide bars protrude, uh, both front and rear. And just flip this over and keep your head about you as you pull these parts out and flip them over. Okay. I can do that. 
you put the angle <laughs> parallel to the yeah, you just got to get them the right width. Right, right. So the one eighth inch, and that's just the blade. So and I've actually gotten pretty good at that. Well, no, I use a Just enough to keep something. Yeah, yeah. I like to This Okay, what I'm having Rob do now is he's putting a safety feature on here that I refer to as the caboose. You're, uh, in order to adequately use this, your, your blade is going to actually be passing through this handle. And you might lull yourself into uh, some sort of false sense of security thinking that you're, you're safe since you got this big block of wood here. But you'll be surprised when that blade comes poking through here. So we've got a substantial piece of wood that we're going to stick on the far side of the, the handle. It'll be the containment area for the, the blade when it penetrates. But you shouldn't need to do that.
again, this is going to require a middle check on your point, on your part rather, that uh, you stop before you go completely through this block because this, this block is a safety feature up to a point where you do what Steve said and put some sort of a stop back here. Some people build their sleds so you reference the wood against the front fence also. Mm -hmm. so that you yeah, you could do that. You could do that here as well. I like I like the idea of being able to hold the thing down with my fingertips while I'm, while I'm sliding the thing through to maintain control that way. I think I'm going to check at this point is uh, I think I can just hear that blade it may not be completely vertical. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm using a, a uh, thing called a gate uh, angle block. Uh, it's also also known as an angle cube. Uh, they sell them out here in the store. So what I've done is I've referenced off the tabletop here. I now reference against the side of the blade. <coughs> and I'm only off by 80 thousandths. Thank you. 